now I know that for sure I'm on the air. And I, I was so excited to get in here because every single time I hear uh, I hear our entrance music, I feel like I'm standing in the, the entrance way to get to the cage or the ring. It's Monday night. It's 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All I know is I'm inside the asylum. Fellas, I have Carl the Man Man Mortensen on the, on the, the board. I have Will Thacker, and I have H.R. Baker. Barker. Baker. How are you fellas doing tonight? I am doing great. Good. How are you doing, Jason? Oh, man. Doing I'm great. Stoked. Doing great. I'm stoked. We, we, we haven't been here for a couple of weeks. Um, I was sick last week, legit sick. Wick, I've been sick for two straight weeks. I actually got in trouble with my job because we talked to to Rob Massey uh, a couple weeks ago, and uh, you know I couldn't go to work Tuesday, Wednesday that week, but I could sure as hell talk to him because he is an interesting fella. We were supposed to have him on the show tonight, but he's got bigger fish to fry. I think I would say after um, some things came out uh, this week in regards to the lawsuit in regards to uh, some stuff he's doing. So we can't have him, but we can have we can have Ryan Jimmo, who um, is in the know and in the mix. So I'm excited to hear what he has to say. Um, I'm sure we're going to get a couple, you know, I uh, can't talk about that because I'll go anywhere we need to go. But, man, it's good to be back. I, I, I get so jacked when I hear the Inside the Asylum music, fellas. What have you been up to this past week? Uh, I've just been going to school, man, just trying to uh, further my education and trying to make it in this crazy world, you know, it's about yeah, be it. Be careful, because eighth grade is hard. Eighth grade is hard. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could yeah, it definitely school. is. <laughs> they wouldn't have me back to school. I'm too damn old. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, it's good to have you guys back. What do you so what the... Uh, you know what have we been? Uh, what have we been following in MMA, combat sports, boxing? You guys do a lot of. You, um, you guys follow a lot you, of uh, different, different uh, local MMA. So what have you guys been doing? What, what do you guys think about the uh, new Ultimate Fighter coming out? Have you seen the the lineups? No, sir. No, how, how's it going? Oh, it's uh, it looks like a good uh, USA. It's got some. Killer guys in there, James Jenkins, Tom Galicio, Tim Welch, Tom Lee, Sweet. Austin Springer, Chris Grutzenmacher. I've seen him fight Show Fight 20, defeating uh, Raleigh Delgado back at Show Fight 20. That was 2011, I think, or 10. I've seen Tom Lee fight at World Fighting Championships and uh, Baton Rouge. He's a tough guy. Uh, you got these ring of combat guys, uh, James Jenkins and uh, Tom Galicio. Them some uh, ring of combat uh, veterans and uh, hey, maximum hey, fighting Galicio. championship veterans. M1 veterans and yeah, Galicio. Like I know. I, I, Galicio is a good dude. What do you think about uh, the young fighters retiring, like Jordan Maine and that uh, Rizzo guy? I mean, that's pretty crazy. They're 25 Thank years you. old. I Thank think you. it's a uh, the Reebok deal. I think they're retiring from UFC because they're not making enough money and, you know, they're just like, why put my blood, sweat, and tears on the line for about $5,000 at the most, really, for the, you know, for my sponsorship deal. That's pretty shitty. So, I mean, <clears throat> I wouldn't blame them if they went to Bellator or something. Yeah. I think it's pretty crazy that these young fighters are retiring, especially, you know, in the UFC. Which, saying a lot. It'd be cool if, like, the older fighters, thought, like, the real big-name fighters did it, too, and with someone Honestly, else. wouldn't you? Wouldn't you retire? I probably would. You know, if, if yeah. someone's going to offer me an opportunity to to fight, you, you know, for unlimited money or money I can make, um, I, I'll go fight there. I'll go fight in the backyard, man. I mean, for the money that these fellows are making at this time point in time with the, uh, the Reebok deal... That's the kind of money like Kimball Slice was making when he was fighting for, um, uh, well, what um, before he got signed by In the backyards. Yeah, man, that's the kind of money he was making, man. It's a joke. Yeah. Why? Well, it's pretty I, crazy I think what's he... going on, like how the monopoly is with UFC and how they lie to all the fans' face and like even to the fighters. The fighters, you know, they really do know what's going on because they read the contract and everything go with it, but they can't really say anything. Because if they do, they get in trouble. 
you know, and they might be destroyed by Dana White, so to speak. You know, I think it's right. bullshit. And these right. fans and the, that are going along with it, it's pretty crazy. You know, I don't, I don't get why these fans are doing it right now with, with Rob Rob Massey and you know his lawsuit and things. That's one of the issues that's that's at the forefront and how um, basically the basis of his entire uh, his entire lawsuit is that it's it's a lie. The UFC and everything they do and every product they put out is basically a lie. So it, yeah. Very, very excited to, to to hear more about it. See it, you know. See how this unfolds. See where Rob and his team go. And it, you know, I, I it's incredible because at first I thought it was kind of a witch hunt. You know, I, I was like, oh, okay, maybe you know. And I'm not a Zufa zombie. I mean, none of us are. I don't think. But no. you know, we we all sit back and we, we enjoy MMA. We enjoy mixed martial arts, and we we sit back and we see, you know, these people getting cut and released and. You know, you know Kung Lee. I mean, Kung Lee is no joke. Uh, um, um, oh shit! What, what, why? Yeah, his highlight reel is book? amazing. You know, I so think why am I need drawing to a see... blank on um, um, Silva? Um, I, I, the ex Vanderlei, Jesus, Mother and Mary, Vanderlei Silva, just making all these allegations and putting out these videos, uh, basically saying that Dana White is. Uh, a, a, a slave driver, a, a, a plantation owner, for lack of a better yeah. term. I mean, Jesus. I mean, it's. I mean, those are some significant uh, allegations, and he's not afraid to make them. And you know, to 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 see where we're at, to see where we're going, and to be able to talk to a couple people that are in the know. Man, I'm excited. Same here, brother. I think, I think we need to see uh, where the Sherman Act comes into play, you know, they have the uh, class action suit. Lee and Corey and Fitch and Plaintiffs, you know, and uh, against Zufa accusing UFC parent company and violating the Sherman Antitrust Act. You know, it's like uh, Tung right. Lee was said that uh, repeatedly uh, they forced him into situations where he had to fight injured and then botched the drug test, he didn't really fail. And that right. right there itself is a violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act. So, uh, yeah, it's I, crazy I how think... they piss on these fighters, man. You know, like Kung Lee, for instance, or Vandalay Silva. You know, why can't they just have an opinion or a right to say something whenever they're in the right? And as soon as Vandalay says something or Kung Lee says something, they're immediately attacked by Dana or his henchmen, pretty much. And if you're not a, a Zufa zombie, or if you are a Zufa zombie, rather, then you jump on their side, and you're like, yeah, fuck Vandalay. You know what I mean? It's like, that's not right, man. These guys have put everything on the line. I mean, look at Vandalay's face. He looks like the te Texas Chainsaw Massacre. You know what I mean? And he's done that because he's been in brutal wars. Same thing right. with Kung Lee. That's why they, they had the Sherman Act passed by Congress in 1890, and it's not to protect the competition, but rather to protect uh, competitors as well as promote a and preserve a competitive landscape, and, and that's explained by the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, well, I think part of I think part of the issue is is the fact that there's a, a monopoly in a in a um, uh, you know it, it, it's it's very focused on um, money with Dana and, and, and the Fertitta brothers, how they feel, what they do. So, you know, I uh, I don't know, man. It, it's it's very frustrating to me because I, I I love the sport of mixed martial arts. I love some of the fighters. Like Ryan Jim was one of my favorites, man. When he was in the NFC, when when he moved to the UFC, I was very excited. I, I looked forward to seeing him fight. And yeah. he's a raw. He he's no dummy. He's not he's not someone that's going to sit back and and just take the beating, the 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 proverbial beating from from the higher ups. Yeah, so, he's not a puppet, you know. Yeah, he's not a puppet, man. And you know, there's there's a ton of guys that are just not willing to to deal with what Dana and Fertitta's have to say. So I'm excited. You know, there's there's a lot of good things coming out of this. There's a lot of good things that are on the on the horizon, and you know, it's it's going to be exciting and fun to, to to see and watch. So, well, Jason, I, I think we got our first guest in the queue. Whenever you guys are ready. Yeah, man. I listen. I, I I'll talk. I'll talk. I'll bitch and moan all day long. Y'all know me. I'm 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 a, I'm a 
pansy at. <laughs> we have a, one, of, one of my favorite guests. I've talked to Ryan. I've talked to Ryan in the past, and and he's very intelligent. He uh, he has a lot to say, and it's very profound. Um, he is one of my favorite fighters in the cage in the ring. Um, Ryan Jimmo, how are you doing tonight, my friend? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I don't know if we're going to be able to live up to the to the hype now. That's a pretty great ah, man. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you, you, every time you and I speak, we, you and I have talked a couple times, and, and you're very profound. You're very, like, just chill and, like, just go with it, man. I'm, I, I enjoy talking to you because you, you kind of drag me back from, like, the edge because I'm always looking to just – I'm always so crazy, and you were, you're very uh, <laughs> even keel. So I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Right. It seems like you're a little well, bit what of a. Yeah. What, what's, what's new, that? man? Where, where, where are you? Where are you at now? I I know you've you've been. Um, you know, you're not with the UFC anymore. Where um, Where are you at? How are things going in in your life? Uh pretty good. Just uh, just been keeping training. Uh, I just competed in a, a Naga tournament this weekend. Just stay active and nice. uh, just staying staying active and, and training and uh, you know facing some of the political uh, things that are on uh, my. My play right now is uh, as well as keeping the training up. And uh, in regards to my fighting, uh, I'm in because of that contract uh, uh, that uh, the UFC so wonderfully ties us down with. Uh, I'm actually, for three months, I'm exclusive with only negotiating with the UFC. So I, uh, it's about a month I'll be able to start negotiating uh, for other fights. So right so now really? I'm kind of sitting on my, sitting on my bench, sitting, sitting on my butt. That's why it kind of explained to me. I'm kind of sitting on my hands right now and, that's okay. I'm kind of enjoying the time off, you know. Yeah, so, Sweet. so you don't you have a non compete clause? Like after you get released from the U.S., you can't compete for three months. If if, if, if I'm reading it correctly, and uh, I believe I am, um, for the first three months, I believe it, it it's an exclusive negotiating phase where um, if you're going to negotiate, you have to negotiate with the U.S.C. And then after that, I I believe I, I, the numbers might be wrong, but I think they have a nine month matching clause afterwards. So, um, which means that if I was like negotiating somewhere else, and then they say, "Hey, ten ten for you," and then UFC can come in and match that, and then I have to uh, stay with the UFC after that. So I'm I, I'm not actually cut. I just they extended the conditions of my contract, unfortunately. <laughs> Yet they can hold you hostage for nine more months if they say, yeah. uh, "Come on over." You you negotiate a, a deal with, say for instance, Bellator for ten yeah. ten, and UFC comes in on the back end and says, "We'll match that." Welcome back to the mm-hmm. UFC. Yeah, yeah, they can do that. Yeah. So, but that's kind of like that. that, that that's like normal. That's a normal condition. That's a normal society that we're dealing with in MMA right now. And I know you had Rob on here um, previously. And uh, sure. Rob probably talked quite a bit about the Muhammad Ali app. Did he get in that with you guys? He did. And, and, and you know what the worst part about it is, um, Ryan, we we had a great conversation going, and then for some reason our board shut down. And it's, you know, we, we're all we're all a bunch of um, um, conspiracy theorists. So we're thinking Dana White was pulling the plug. We thought he was right inside. Uh, but no, we, we did have a conversation with him, and it was a great conversation. And that's actually why we're talking to you today. I want to get kind of the background, and then I want to—I just want to go full bore into the Muhammad Ali Act, in, into the lawsuit, whatever you can yeah. talk about. Let's talk about it. Let's do it. Yeah, let, let, let's talk about the Muhammad Ali Act because yeah, yeah, Muhammad Ali Act is, is going to like kind of like solve a lot of problems that that, that are happening that we're seeing and people are complaining about. It. And I heard you guys talking a little bit before. I came on there, um, and, and what's on a couple of things? It does a few things, and what the main things it does is right now the UFC is a promoter, and they pick who fights, when they fight. They pick, they they make the rankings. They pick who's going to fight for the belt. They do all these things. Okay, they 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 control every kind of aspect of it. The Muhammad Ali Act was brought in in in, in, in 1999 to stop boxing from just happening in boxing because. All of a sudden, when, when, when it's that sort of relationship, it's a very unbalanced relationship. UFC calls all the shots. The fighters are, are left to, like, they're basically prisoners, and they have to, like, you know, negotiate with the warden to get, uh, I don't know, an extra 
an extra piece of cake at the end of their meal in the prison, right? Like, like they're literally, like, negotiating for small, like, sideways leverage at all the time in their own career when they're supposed to be in these independent contractors. So how, how right. it works in the Muhammad Ali Act is two fighters get together, like Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao. They get together and they're like, hey, we want to put in a fight. And what they do is they hire um, a promotion company, let's say it's Golden Boy or Big Punchy Productions, to, as independent contractors to put on that fight. So instead of like the promotion having holding all the cards and calling all the shots, now it's more of an even relationship. In fact, I think it's probably better for the fighter. Because all of a sudden the fighters can look at each other and go, wait, this guy's prices are really high and they provide pretty good, you know, a good product. But these guys have lower prices but provide a better product. So all of a sudden instead of the fighters competing against each other, each other you have the, com- uh, the promotion competing against each other in order to um, please the fighter. So it, it actually kind of reverses the power sequence of how that works and puts the people who do all the, like, bloody hard work kind of back in the driver's seat. And, and that's, that's, that's one of the main things. Another thing it does is the promotion has to disclose every bit of money that, that comes into, um, that they put into the promotion. Like So that means that there's no more locker room bonuses, okay? They're illegal in boxing. They're not allowed to have that. And there's a, couple, there's a good reason why, okay? Can you, you have explain most to me, Ryan? I, I don't want to cut you off because you, yeah. you're you on a tear, but can you, I mean, I'm in a layman. Can, you, can yeah. you take me through a locker room bonus? Can you take me through everything you're telling me? Yeah, so, so, so a locker room bonus, and I'm, if anyone's had their ear to the ground a little bit, they're, they're, you know, they hear about these, like, oh, when they release the, the numbers, how much guys are getting paid. And usually the argument back is, yeah, but these guys are getting locker room bonuses. They're getting, like, checks for $10,000. or are getting checks for this much money. Wow. We don't really know how much it is, okay? And so mm-hmm. one thing that does is it kind of manipulates the fighters behind the scenes, right? Another thing that does, okay, so it, the guys that they, they like, they kind of manipulate and, or they want to keep happy. They can, like, pay them off you know, a little bit. It's kind of almost like a little bit of a bribe. It's, it's not a bribe. But, like, you could kind of see it like that, but it's not, you know. It, it, but it, it's a way to manipulate people behind the scenes. And most guys don't come out and say, hey, yeah, I got these big bonuses because okay. it, it'll, it'll anger the other fighters, okay? And yeah. another thing yeah. it kind of does, it, it can leverage the fight. If two guys are fighting, okay, let's say me and John Smith, and they really want to build John Smith into a big star, well, they can give him a $50,000 you know, locker room bonus, right? So that, and I'm barely keeping my lights on with my with my my paycheck, you know. And then he can hire better trainers, better better rehab, better everything, right? So it's a it, it's a way to manipulate the the background uh, of the of the story that no one really has sure. an idea about. Yeah, that 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 sure. answer the question. Yes, absolutely. And I'm not trying to cut you off because I want you to keep telling me about. Uh, I want you to walk into the entire Muhammad Ali Act, but, you know, there's people that don't follow quite as much as, you know, we all yeah. do. So I appreciate you, 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 you kind of filling us in on, on some of the, the verbiage. So I appreciate that. Yeah. I'm sorry. I kind of got going off on a little bit of a tear there myself. No, see? bro. You see? So no, that's perfect. There. Yeah, you're We're like, hey, man, listen, the just say you're so even I, killed, could you bring me back? I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I got to i got a dog eating a bone next to me. We're good, brother. We're, we will sit and talk all night. Absolutely. So I heard, Ryan, this is Waylon Thacker, man. Uh, pleasure to talk to you. Uh, this is kind of off subject, but I heard she was a ninja. I am a bit of a ninja. ninja. Yeah. <laughs> so, That's pretty do cool. You want me to get, do you want, to get me, want me to get into that story or what? Yeah. Okay, so when I was like 14 years old, I can't believe I'm telling this. Um, <laughs> like, I got a ninja uniform for Halloween, you know. I was like, yeah, I love ninjas. I got a real, you know, I just put those tabby boots. And um, so my buddy and I used to sneak out every weekend. Like, I know it sounds a little bit goofy, but I'm I'm talking about like we would train for hours upon hours on being stealthy, practice certain kind of walking and climbing techniques. We used to go buy some metal at the at the hardware store and like get a grinder and make ninja stars and blow darts. And, <laughs> and I'm not doing like, Yeah, so for years and years, I, I did that. And uh, probably until I was about like 
22. And uh, at 22, you know, I'm sitting there in a ninja uniform you know, on Saturday night and in some bushes. And I started thinking to myself, like, what's the next stop step here? Like, mall cop? Is that, is that going to be my next stop? <laughs> mall cop? You know, it's like, I made some bad decisions in my life, and uh, I should really evaluate this. But on the, on the other side, if anyone ever kidnaps my loved ones, you know, I'll be able to recognize yeah. them. So it's, it's kind of a good deal. When did you get started in mixed martial arts? Uh, I've been competing in uh, karate since I was 10, and uh, I'm 33 now. Uh, I've done that for 13 years. Did pretty good on it. Uh, I got some. I got one nationals four times, some silver and bronze medal at Pan Ams, went and competed in Commonwealth Games. Um, and then 2007, you know, I looked at uh, karate, and it was an amateur sport, and I said, my dreams aren't, I'm not going to be able to accomplish my dreams here. You know, I, I, I wanted something that was like a little bit bigger and brighter that there's going to be opportunities off of. So I, I set my eyes on mixed martial arts. I said I can learn some ground game. You know, I've got the good karate, and uh, and I can kind of make my dreams come true. I always wanted to be a movie star, and, you know, Bruce Lee and Van Damme were kind of my heroes. So was Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. I said, this is the way I have to go. So I guess uh, I think I took my first fight in 2007. I'd only been trained mixed martial arts for about six months, but... Uh, I was a pretty quick learner, and uh, I lost that one, and then uh, then I, I won a whole bunch after that. So, you know, I like to say yeah, you got some history, serious but. power. Uh, have you always possessed knockout power, or did you just have to train to get it? You know what? Um, you know, in karate, it was all point touch stuff. You know, and and I was considered a bit of a bruiser in the, on the karate circuit. You know, just because I did have a little bit of power and I was a, a bigger guy, but uh, not inherently. I don't think. I think sometimes, like Anderson Silva, I don't think he was knocking out a whole bunch of dudes early on in his career, but it's like early 30s or something. When he went to the UFC, he started, like, just dropping guys. You know, he, he found that power. He found his timing. And, uh, you know, I, yeah. I think that's that's a lot of it. You start finding your timing. You start finding your distance. You feel comfortable with your, yourself. You start getting that old man strength. And, uh, yeah, it just kind of came on a little bit later. Uh, I wasn't knocking people out when I was younger. So I was just pointing them. So, you know, yeah. you got the quickest knockout in UFC history. I remember whenever I saw that and seen the robot right afterwards, I was, I was yelling at my friends. I was like, that guy is going to be a superstar. You watch and see. You know what I mean? And it was just incredible, man. Been a fan ever, oh. fan ever since then. Oh, thanks, man. That was a good night. <laughs> hey, Ryan, this is H.R. Yeah. Baker. And I've, I've been with Mal House for almost three years, but I just want to get back on the Ali Act a minute. And uh, yeah. it's been said that the Ali Act was written solely for boxing and can't be yeah. applied to the MMA. Boxing and MMA are really just apple and oranges. Saying boxing and MMA are so different that MMA is more akin to Major League Baseball, NFL, or NBA. Now, uh, when I see that, because I'm old school, man. I, I was raised up in the 60s and 70s. I think yep. of Kurt Flood, you know Kurt Flood, he, he played for the St. Louis Cardinals for 12 years. He's a Hall mm-hmm. of Famer, and he's the reason uh, Major League Baseball has free agency. And and mm-hmm. I think he said it best, he doesn't want to be owned, but you should be able to control your career. Now, is, is mm-hmm. this all he at, is it something that is that has come up where it has to be rewritten? And, and maybe uh, put a Wanderlei Silva Act in front of it, or 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 just how is that going to work? I mean, that, 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 that's a that's a great question. So uh, I think um, in all those sports that you named, um, they all have players associations. Like uh, the NFL, we went to one of the meetings. I went there with uh, Rob and Wanderlei um, a couple of months ago, probably about six months ago, and they have a players association. Major League, ba- Major League Baseball, like say Kurt Flood, they have a players' association, and and that helps group uh, bargaining. So they can go in and uh, you know bargain as a group with the owners. Say we don't want this. You got to change these rules. So I, I think they're both kind of necessary. So the Muhammad Ali Act is going to change some of the the how the chess pieces work on the board, and I I think the association is is going to kind of be able to bargain for some other finer points. If we do the Muhammad Ali Act, we won't be owned. Right now, we're 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 kind of for the most part like the baseball players were. Um, 
in the sixties and seventies, and same with the football players. We're kind of owned. Yeah, we're we're kind of like underneath that one umbrella, and we're locked in. And it's not really independent contracting. It's something a little bit different, but it's in a gray area. So um, I think the Muhammad Ali Act will, will change that, and then we're going to need an association to come in and uh, fine tune and still have that group bargaining. So it, it's a little bit of a multi-faceted uh, problem that has to be solved. You know, when when guys were like, "Yeah, they're, you guys should just form a union," I'm like. That's a great idea. You can be head Pumba. I'll be the vice Pumba. You know, this guy can be the treasurer, and you can look after the paperwork. It's going to be awesome. You know, but uh, and, and I did quite a bit of that in my karate years when I was younger. Um, but this is a different ball game. You know, um, yeah. they have lobbyists, and you have to change like labor laws on a federal level, and it, it, it's a pretty pretty complex problem. You know. Mm-hmm. Right. Let me now, ask you. Now, now I know it's been a uh, 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 Silver and Fitch and Quarry been publicly known, and others, which is uh, wish not to have their ID revealed. But uh, the, some of these fighters attended the Collegiate Bowl, which is you know a past season college football game. It lasts all week event for NFL mm-hmm. draft eligibles and and this is not only a game but an event that lasts all week which are yep. intended to introduce the new generation of NFL players to the players' union and educate them on the business side of the pro football. Was, was, was that any help at. this year that, that, that uh, was these huge. guys went? And... Yeah, so that, that was a meeting that I was referring to that, that I, I attended. And uh, I, I'll tell you what, and, and it happened for all of us. We uh, – Fitch, Fitch said this directly – other guys, you can see in their eyes, and I recognize it myself. Um, he's like, if you didn't go and sit in that room and saw Dave Maurice talk about all the things and how the the how their association ran and how they've gained bargaining power and their history and how it's grown, you wouldn't believe that that's how it operated. We we're all in awe. We we're all kind of sitting there like, oh my god you guys get treated this well and you guys have this kind of representation, if we didn't see it ourselves, we wouldn't believe it. And that's where I think a lot of fighters are right now. They're just like, they don't realize that they're in a bad situation. It's almost like the fighters are like uh, 1950s housewives and if they don't like, you know, clean the can opener off, they're getting smacked around. Some European woman comes in and says, you guys get hit by your husband? That's ridiculous. And they're all like scratching their head looking at this European woman because, that's just the way it is. So uh, we had another meeting here in Phoenix where we had um, some fighters and, and, and uh, it, it's from the Arizona area and, uh, and a couple coaches. And we had uh, a couple of other associates that are helping us form our association. And they said the same thing. They're like, I didn't realize how organized this was. I thought it was just going to be a couple of fighters getting together and complaining a little bit, but there's like there's some serious heavy hitters here, and this has some real legitimacy. This has like this is this is real. This is going to happen. So, get, to get back to your question, when we went to that meeting and we saw that other athletes are treated like that, and other athletes have that kind of representation, and they have have a, lawyers and, and whole slews of teams fighting for them just to make sure that they get more money, just to make sure that they get their, their rights, just to make sure that they don't get screwed over by the by the owners of the teams. It was like, boom, my eyes opened quite wide. I'm like, oh, my God, we are in the Stone Ages. Soon enough, <laughs> we're going to look back the way MMA is, like, run, and it's going to be like, if we look back to, like, what was the 50s, that, that black people weren't allowed to sit anywhere except on the back of the bus, and people would, like, complain if black people would try to sit at the front of the bus. And people would defend the fact that black people should sit back there. But if we look back at that now, it's ridiculous. But people at the time were like, no, no, they should sit there. But it's absolutely ridiculous that we were treated like they, they were treated like that at the time. But no one in that time frame really re- realized that. And that's what we're going to look back at our time here. Within over the last 10 years, the way the UFC, treat, UFC treats the fighters, it's going to be like, oh, my God. You guys got treated like that and paid that little and had all your rights, like, locked up. And you guys, I, I can't believe that. It's unbelievable, you know. And I can't believe people went along with that. That's what we're going to do in, like, 20 or 30 years. 
Right. I, just kind of a two part question. Do you yeah. feel like like is one of your this is such an ignorant question on my part, but do you feel like one of your hopes and dreams right now is to get signed by Bellator for like a like a twenty twenty contract? Because the UFC has nothing but um like kind of blonde, right. really. I mean they would that help the the lawsuit ahead? I guess is what I'm asking. If, it, it, if that was for, for another another agency or a, a, another organization that to sign you to to a contract, basically, because they're they're kind of holding you hostage, is what I understand. Hey, yeah, I mean, you, you could you kind of say that. I mean, from my my understanding of of the of the contract, that's that's the way it is. Um, I, I of course could be wrong. I, I'm not a lawyer. Of course, but of course. I, I believe that's all. I'm not asking. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So, but I, the, the question is, would that help that along if if they're kind of holding you hostage? And yeah. I, I'd like to, yeah, I'd like to answer that. And I'm, I'm like, I, I don't really know enough about the intricacies of the lawsuit to answer that. But I, I can tell you, um, from what I know, um, they're going to lose that lawsuit <laughs> pretty handily. And, they uh, in Zufa? Yes, yes. I mean, this has happened with every other sport. You know, like the NFL guys had to do it, and, uh, you know, eventually it, this is just like our adolescent stage when you're, like, kind of awkward and pimply and kind of weird and stuff and you haven't got any social sk- skills. That's where we are right now as a sport. We are going through this this, this phase, but we're almost going to be growing up soon. We're almost there. So, um, <laughs> and hopefully, I mean, See, the thing with that Muhammad Ali Act, if that goes in, all of a sudden, all that power that Zufa has, it's kind of like it's pulled away from them, and it's almost like an even playing ground with the, the with the different companies, with the Bellators, because they can all compete and buy for the fighters' attention, and, and, and the fighters are, are the ones kind of in charge. So that's going to take a lot of that, that window of their sale and stop them from being monopoly. Right, we're- or so-called yeah. monopoly. I don't want to get sued. Please forgive me when I ask this question, but were you, because you've been released, how long have you been out of out of the UFC? Um, how long have you been? Yeah, I think uh, it's June sometime, I think I was officially. Yeah. Okay. So just as the, the, the Reebok deal was coming in, you were kind of on the way out? Is that yes. fair to say? So okay. I, didn't get how, to, I didn't get to get touched by that. How do you feel about the the Reebok deal? So, um, I feel... <laughs> I, I voice my opinion pretty pretty, pretty handily on this. Um, in the media... <laughs> and that's why I love it, having you on. Fine, you, you've been nothing but candid every single time we talk, and that's why I love having you on. I know. <laughs> and I, and I'm sorry I put you in the spot. So I, <laughs> so I don't know if I'm really stupid or really smart, but, like, anyway, here we go. <laughs> So I've been very candid. I've been very candid about this, and um, when I ask questions at my last fight, they have this kind of—I'll call it an indoctrination session. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll just refer to it as that, just because I like fun big word. Um, and they bring all the fighters in, and, and and I mean, for the most part, the people that are are putting you know this kind of presentation on, I think they're just trying to like you know have a smooth transition and stuff. But they kind of you know tell you about the Reebok deal and how they're going to help you and all this kind of stuff. And A lot of guys, their first questions are, I'm losing a lot of money. I mean, the one I had, um, it was a couple of guys like cursing and yelling at these people. Like, I'm losing a lot of money. I'm losing a lot of money. And the thing is, guys don't realize that it's not the, well, the money sucks. Guys are losing a lot of money. But where that really is hurtful to to the, the, the fighters. And what makes it so wrong is we weren't, you know, we weren't asked about it at all. They didn't ask our opinion. We don't have a player's association in order to bargain that, you know. We, we don't have someone in the room bargaining for our behalf. So basically, we're just like basically in, in a neat roulette, you know what I mean? But that's all they see us as, and they're they're running us like cattle. You know, so I mean, ba- that's, that's basically you took it on the chin and said, "Yes, boss." I mean, basically, th- that's that's what we we're required to do. And as right. you can see, um, I don't know if you're seeing Gangs in New York. 
Yep. So Bill the Butcher, you know. That's a great movie. And, uh, <laughs> it is a great, great movie. And I and listen, this is a horrible reference, but I'm sure if uh, anyone from Zoo Fair ever gets wind of this, they're going to be so proud of themselves because that's the only that they would look up to. <laughs> I'm so proud. Uh, <laughs> I know exactly where you're going, and I'm so proud. <laughs> yeah. So, like he said, hey, if you're gonna if you're gonna kill a kill like a king, you do it in the courtroom in front of everyone, right. and that's what they do. They just like like an old mob, right? And like with Stitch, I'll use Stitch as an example. They, I think they knew that that was going to happen. They made sure that they sent a strong message. If anyone's going to talk out against us, we're going to can you. Yeah. Like, even like an iconic figure like Stitch, you can still get fired. They're, they're sending a pretty strong message there. They're trying to tell people, you better shut up or there's going to be repercussions. Mike, can I ask you a question? This is just, this is, I'm not trying to bait anybody. I'm not trying to anything. I just, this is just a serious question. Because I've I've spoken to Gary Goodrich a um, number of mm-hmm. times, and he, and he's he's given me information about pride, and he's given me information about early UFC days. Do you feel with this this deal, this um, the, the the way things are going, that um, the UFC or mixed martial arts today th- there could be like boxing? I mean, let's not get ourselves. I mean, combat sports and you know, there's there's people that are the puppeteers, let's call them. Do you mm-hmm. feel or have you heard or do you know if there's any, do I call it rigging? Do I call it, um, do, do I call it, um, you know, not on the up we'll call, up? We'll, we'll, call, we'll call it leveraging. How's that? Okay. Um, in okay. any fight, yeah. I feel like all of the fights are on the up and up. Okay, so... This is a pretty difficult question, and I believe this is uh, something that uh, Wandelay is getting kind of in a little bit of hot water for, and uh, he's probably going to win that one, actually. Um, but um, I think when, in, 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 in the fight world, what we, when we hear someone say fix and fight, we hear say, and I'm not, say, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that that's what they're doing. I don't but want to get I, sued. I, 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 because I don't want to pigeonhole you. So don't worry, I'm gonna answer this. I know, I know what lines I have to skirt here. Don't worry. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Please, please don't. Yeah, yeah. Please don't. So okay. So in other sports, let's say football. Okay, football would be like if one team has the best facilities um, and are be, being given certain. Um, trainers and the best trainers and the best training facilities and the best coaches and the league knows this and another team in the NFL is being given poor trainers and poor rehab facilities and bad equipment and crappy fields and the league is setting this up specifically like that, other sports would see something like that as leveraging an outcome. Right? Now I'm not saying UFC does this but in traditional fighting world, we watch old movies and you see one guy getting paid off or whatever, you take a dive. I, as far as I know, that's never, ever happened. As far as I know, that's never happened. So that's how we see in the fight world leveraging fights, okay, or, or, or doing that. That's how we see that. And, that and, 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 and we have a very narrow view of it, you know. So in other sports, if they were doing things like, you know, Given one 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 side a, a, a distinctive advantage, that could be seen as something that's the leveraging an outcome. So um, again, I'm not saying anyone's fixing anything or everyone's leveraging something. I'm just saying they could be perceived as altering the outcome by controlling some of the the variables in that equation. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. because they don't make it yeah. easy to, to want to like them. They make it very difficult when, when you know, the, 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 the captain of the ship comes out and says, I'm the captain of the ship, you either follow me or you jump overboard, basically. And, and that's kind of, and, and when I see, you know, what's so funny, because a couple of weeks ago when I spoke with Rob, and he was kind of giving me the breakdown of the Ali Act and, and the, the anti-trust lawsuit and, and, and things like that, I was like, Jesus Christ, man! These guys are not only trying to throw the the captain overboard; they're trying to they're, they're trying to sink the ship, man. You guys are yeah. like, wait, you guys are no, like, I want to say no joke, but you guys really have 
the, the UFC by the short and curlies, and I don't know how much you can speak of the new the new information that came out recently, but they're trying to hide a bunch of stuff, and I'm not saying that they're trying to hide, you know, fix and fights and this, that, and the other, but listen, I've talked to Dana's mom, I've talked to a bunch of people in the know, and there's some stuff to be known. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Hey, Ryan, I'm going to jump in here. Uh, do you think this is destroying the UFC's image? I mean, I know it is, but do you think, like, the even the Zufa zombies, as we like to call them, do you think they're, that they're going to wake up and realize that, you know, this is nothing but just a monopoly or just like another, you know, modern-day mafia just trying to make slavery of the fighters and make the, you know, the fans dumb? Do you think it's going to hurt their image and they're going to wake up? So this is what I think is happening right here. Um, I think, uh, um, do you remember when you were a teenager or like an early teenager and you said the F word? You kind of got a whole yeah. bunch of attention. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. But as you became like, you know, an adult and you're at your workplace in an office and you start dropping the F bomb, people are starting to look at you like, what's this idiot doing? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> well, I, say, I say it all the time. My, my, my coworker yeah, is I'm an idiot all day long. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 but you know what I mean? Like, if you're acting one way when you're 12 years old and it's cool, but then you're, like, 20 years old and you're still acting and doing the same things for attention you did when you were 12, well, people start to, like, question, like, who they're really hanging around with, right? Like, hey, you know what? You're you're getting a little older. You're not 12. Like, you have to kind of sort of act like an adult. I, I use that bomb just because it's fun and, and visceral, but, like, your behavior is kind of not in line with how old you are. So you need to stop that. And if they don't stop, they lose that friend, right? So yeah, that's right. the way I see the the, the, the way that the uh, UFC is. It's like early on, they they got away with being kind of rogues. They got away with being, um, you know, like almost like a car crash, a wreck. You can't, you have to look at it, and and, and that's fine and dandy. It served them well at the time, but now it's like, well, you're kind of growing up. You have to like go and put your big boy pants on, and uh, you know, be like the NFL, be like. Be like the MLB, be like the NBA. You have to do these things because, you know, that's kind of important, you know, that you grow up and, and become a real sport and get an association and deal with things on a professional level and stop being like that to fans, you know. So I think that's where we're at right now, and I hope they grow up. Hey, Ryan, yeah. I just have a real question. Is, is Dana White just a figurehead? Is he just the loudmouth sister of the, the big brother? I mean, basically... Um, you know what, I'd like to, to really voice uh, an opinion on that, but I just don't have a solid one to do. You know, it's like sure. I don't really have any uh, background. I haven't been in the back office. I don't know what their back uh, kind of business deal is, so I can't really say, but you, might be, you would think. You might be my, my best friend's little brother who just learned how to use the F word, basically, is what he reminds yeah. me of. You know what I mean? Like, my best friend who was like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm going to be 40 here in November, and he reminds me of my, like, 17-year-old little brother's friend who just started learning how to swear. You know what I mean? Yeah, just like, drunk <laughs> a beer, and now he's a sailor, you know? It's like, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. 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 I, 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 go ahead, bud. I mean, if you if you um, if you look at uh, if you look at some of the press conferences, they're actually I think they're starting to muzzle Dana a little bit more. You know, like Tom Wright's starting to do a, little, a few more of them. They're starting to get other people who have a little more polished um, diplomatic sense to them um, uh-huh. to go up and do those. You know, because they, they don't want Dana up there up there dropping the F bomb. Fox is like, hey, hold on a second, what is this guy doing on the microphone? What do you mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> that Neanderthal, that Neanderthal doesn't know how to speak. Is that what you're talking about? <laughs> no, I think yeah. I mean, they they have to look at. It. I think especially Fox. You know, they, they the NFL comes in, and the NFL has their own problems, but they they deal with stuff pretty professionally. You don't have like guys on there dropping you know f bombs and saying stuff like that. It's like Fox would come in and say, hey, like um, you have to keep that guy away from the microphone because he said stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> they, they they have to do that, you know. I mean, as as Fox, I mean, they're a multi, you know, billion dollar company. You know, even if they're looking at, I, I suspect that they're looking at UFC as a sport, you know, as a sport like NFL or you know they're going to run this as as another sport on TV, and they want a professional, polished look, which is something that we deserve, you know. Um, 
and, and that comes with people's behavior as well. Or they could be looking at it as WWE, where people kind of act kind of outrageous and kind of crazy. But even Vince McMahon doesn't come on the mic and make fun of fans. He doesn't come on the mic and, you know, drop the f bomb. You know, we, we we need we need to grow up and get a little more polished, is what I'm saying. And he it, also and bashes and fighters that, too, which is completely unprofessional. You know, how are you going to bash somebody who's making you money, especially when they're putting their life on the line for their for their family, you know, and for your organization? I I just think it's completely crazy that he, uh, you know, he, he even bashed Anderson Silva when he fought Damian Maya. Yeah, it wasn't the greatest fight in the world, but you know, how can you do that? You know what I mean? Like it's just it's it's it baffles me. I, I was thinking about this the other the other day, and uh, I was like, I remember when when the icons in the sport were George St. Pierre and Anderson Silva, right? And yeah. they were very well spoken. They were gentlemen. They were this. Now we have Ronda Rousey and Conor McGregor. Oh God! <laughs> you know Conor I mean? McGregor's you know fans I mean? are crazy. I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. biggest trolls in the I, world. I, 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 if you're not one of them, you don't you. you are a peon basically in in the eyes of the the mommy daddy and their baby really. That, that's the way to see it. Unless you're like like doing foolish things and being loud mouth and saying disrespectful things right. like okay yeah okay okay and, and that's the industry we're in I guess. I just hope uh, someday. See right now the culture right now is top down. So like they kind of decide what's cool and what's not. It's not the fighters who are deciding the culture right now, okay? Like skateboarders, for instance. Skateboarders decide what's cool. They decide how what kind of boards they want to make. They decide what kind of shoes they're going to wear. They decide what kind of styles they're going to do, what kind of skate parts they're going to do. They're in charge of that stuff. We are not. Fighters are not in charge of how this sport is unfolding to people. We're not in charge of uh, the culture. And, and there's a lot of culture. We have many different martial arts that are, you know, hundreds of years old, that are kind of, it's a real engine driving this. And uh, we're the culture, you know, that, that that's driving this engine. We're the heartbeat. We're, we're, we're the engine, pick, you know? You can't even so, pick the clothes you wear into the ring. I mean, anymore. You can't even, yeah. you can't even pick the clothes you wear to, to go get weighed in, even if you have to strip them off all the way down to being naked, basically. Like, you may have to strip all the way down, and you still have to wear what they want you to wear. So one thing that this does is we're considered independent contractors. Um, and one thing that this does is this starts skirting the line. I think there's like seven or eight things of what you need to be employing, what you need to be uh, an independent contractor. And if you have a certain amount of things that you're considered employee. So we're starting to skirt that line of being employees. Employees usually have medical benefits, like real medical benefits, you know, not whatever the thing that they, they're they trying to say they have. Um, and we're starting to skirt that line where, you know, a union can start being made if, it, if we are, in fact, you know, uh, employees. And so we're skirting that line with the uniform coming in. This is just something that they've been thinking of doing for years and years, though. So, so are you telling me that you... If you get injured, you don't have medical coverage. Well, well, no. Uh, if you you have some medical coverage, but uh, it's it's not the best thing in the world. So, um, yeah. see, hey, you your guys, medical coverage you guys, is not the best thing in the world. When you're getting punched in the face, possibly getting opened up by a knee, to yeah. lose your eye. Tell me, take me through a, take me through an injury. Well, I mean. If it happens in the fight, usually, I mean, I broke my arm. It, 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 it's paid for in your, your – your, if it happens during the fight, it's paid for. Um, I haven't got hurt in camp, so I can't really comment on that. Uh, but I do know there is a plan in place, but it's not a great one. It's enough to kind of – it's kind of like the bare minimum, like to say that they have medical coverage. Does that make oh. sense? Dominic yeah. Cruz is not making a fortune every time he pulls out of a fight is what you're telling me. <laughs> Certainly not. He's got that Fox NLS money paying his bills, I'm sure. Hey, Ryan, this is HR again. I, I want to kind of switch it around just a second. And, uh, you know, referring to the uh, uh, UFC's athlete health and performance policy, you just quote saying 
when will enough be enough for fighters to band together and take a stand? What exactly would you say to the fighters or the fans about this policy, and what would you say in the way the UFC controls the fighters if you only had just just one last thing to say about the whole deal? What would you what would you say to these to these fighters? Uh, I, I would say we spend all our time uh, paying attention to training, paying attention to fighting, pay attention to wrestling, striking, jiu-jitsu, but there's a whole other side of this that everyone turns up a line nine to, and I would encourage everyone to look very much deeper into it, like go down the rabbit hole a little bit because they're just basically sitting on the surface right now, and, and, and some of them are making their opinions, some of them are not, some of them don't care. And I would just encourage them to educate themselves. That's a good deal. That's fair. Hey, Ryan, I got a quick question for you. Um, yeah. If the UFC ever did get rid of the Reebok deal and actually started treating their fighters, you know, like how they should be treating them, would you ever consider for fighting for the UFC again? Um. Yes. Yes. Yes, I would. Um. And, and again, I, I'm I'm not a person who thinks. Things can't change because I, I, I believe they can. So I'm willing to give anyone kind of a second chance or, or whatever you want to call it. But uh, um, I believe Rob sent it to me. And it's an Al Pacino movie. And Matthew McConaughey is in it. You guys might know the movie. And they're like running a betting ring, you know. And uh, yeah. Matthew McConaughey is like this young hot shot. And he's like, hey, you know, I just made this $50 million. And he goes up to Al Pacino and he's like, hey, can I have a cut of it? He's like, yeah, yeah, how much do you want? He's like... How about fifty percent? He's like, ha ha and he grabs him, he's like and he said something like, How about five percent? And he's like, What what are you talking about? I just made you like fifty million dollars and he grabbed by the by the collar and he's like, If you want my money, you're gonna have to rip it out of my dead hand you know, and then he lets him go and he's all smiling and happy again. I think we're kinda of dealing with that. You know what I mean? I think we're Matthew McGonaghy and we're making Al Pacino a lot of money and we're like, Hey, can we have like our fair share? And they're like no way, it's my money. You try to take it from me, you're in trouble, and then, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. let's, let's jump ahead, oh, three years, two years, maybe. So, yeah. Dana White, the face of the UFC? Um, you know, that, that's impossible to say. Um, I, I would say, um, as time wears on, um, uh, it, it's hard to say. Dana White's not in that position because he's a stupid human. Um, And one thing that you can hope is either he curtails that behavior, like making fun of fans on Twitter and and that kind of stuff that... um, Yeah, yeah. Well, you you, you hope that he does. You hope that he looks at his behavior because everyone sometimes has it. And maybe that's why I'm way too idealistic for my own good. But he he curtails that. You're a good man. I know. I I, I know. (laughs) And it's been my, my demise all the time. Um, <laughs> if he if he doesn't stop that sort of behavior, best for the sport, it's best for the business. At the UFC, even though you know I don't see I'm not eye to eye with them uh, in the way that they do their business policies, and you know um, it's best for them to kind of stop him from fulfilling that role, and uh, you know maybe fill another role in the company or you know wherever they want to do with them, however they want to deal with that. But yeah, I, I can see him. He's starting to hurt the sport in a certain ways. Um, he's helped it tremendously, I'm sure. Uh, Agreed. But he, he, he's, certainly, he's certainly hurting it. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. Today's, what, tomorrow, I guess, in a couple hours, is going to be September 1st, 2015. Um, yeah. I, you know, you're, you're, for all intents and purposes, your UFC career is over. I mean, really, let's mm-hmm. not, let's all stay to Spain. Where do you, yeah. what, what is Brian Jimmo doing now? Where are you going? What are you doing what, what can we expect next from, from Ryan Jimmo? Because I love watching you fight. i got to be honest with you. If you're not going to fight anymore, I'm going to fly up to wherever you're at, and we're going to fight just because I want to watch you fight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I don't I want to cover that. that. <laughs> it, it, it's hard to say. I, I've, had, uh, I've had one kind of person reach out to me about, uh, you know, possibly fighting in the future. Um, nothing official, just say, would you be interested? I said, yeah, I probably would be. Um, so uh, when it becomes time, uh, I'm going to go wherever I feel like I'm going to get the best treatment, it, it, be it YFC, be it Bellator, 
be it World Series. Um, uh, I would like to fight once before the year is over, and then several times next year. And uh, but we'll see what 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 the what comes down the pipeline right now. You know, so Wait, hard that. When you say when you say fighting several times next year, so yeah. you fight. Um, I think of Floyd Mayweather because he always fights yeah. in March and September. So mm-hmm. are, is that kind of how you want to, like, stack your card? Like, here's my thing. I, I'm a big fat guy. You and I have never mm-hmm. met. We've talked. I'm a big fat guy. I okay. can't wrap my head around uh, a weight cut, um, a training camp, uh, um, some type of, like, just – Focusing myself to do, I, I, let's call a spade a spade. I have no willpower. I want to eat burgers and chips. So How do, I. do you, I mean, you know, it, we're in September of the previous year, and you're already talking about cutting weight and whatever. Like, you're already talking about dragging yourself through just nonsense in 2016. How the hell do you get yourself there, man? Is this something you've always wanted to do? Uh, yeah, I've always been kind of a a maniac with training. I mean, even, like, right now, I'm a little bit out of shape, and I had to do a jiu-jitsu tournament on the weekend just because I kind of get the itch to compete, you know? So, uh, you know, I uh, I know i got a couple of years left. We only have a small window of fighters, and luckily, uh, right now, we're seeing a lot of resurgence of older fighters coming back and having just pretty awesome careers, you know? So, yeah. uh, I'm 33 right now. I'm looking at fighting probably now three, maybe four years at the very most. And uh, you know, I want to I want to get a lot of fights in. I I fought three times in seven weeks one time, so I would literally wow. if I could get if I could get that if I could get a lot of fights back to back, I, I would I would do that. One one thing that was kind of hard because the UFC had so many fighters was getting fights because you had to schedule them like four months in advance. And then it's like if I was just spending like a fight and like hey I want to get another one right away, well it's going to be three or four months probably, you know. So one thing I want to I want to be able to be pretty active. Well, and you don't suck, you don't, I mean, you know, let's call space space, you don't suck the dick of the, the UFC guy. So, I mean, you're not going to get, you're not on top of their list. So, it is what it is. But, so, you you just fought Naga a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Or last week, right? So, uh, is that something, yeah. is, is that something that you want to, to to look to incorporate in your next contract, whether it be with, with the World Series, with Bellator, whatever, like, you're able to... I mean, clearly you're not going to be able to sign with World Series of Fighting and then fight in Bellator, clearly. I mean, you know, there's a not going to yeah. be there, but Naga or another grappling tournament or, you know, no, wrestling no, so, tournament. So Is that something if, you want to do? If the Muhammad Ali Act goes through, then you will be able to do that. Like, fighters aren't locked down to one promotion in the Muhammad Ali Act. They're able to go fight as independent contractors wherever they wish and wherever they choose. So, um, although that's probably going to be a little while coming in, but I would like to have something like that in. That maybe if I want to take a boxing or kickboxing fight, or usually stuff like Naga and Jiu-Jitsu tournaments, and you know, like karate tournaments or something like that, then they're 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 pretty lenient with that kind of stuff, just because it's like pretty low risk. Wow, but they won't let another usually won't let another promotion grab hold of you. So, um, uh, Sergey uh, Katerov, he's a big Russian guy. He fought. Uh, he fought uh, M1. He fought Pride. Do you guys know who I'm talking about? You sound yeah, familiar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Krokonoff, or I, I forget what his name is. He's a big, big Russian Kro- guy. He's a blonde Kro- guy with a Kro- Kro- nose. Yes, I yeah. know exactly who you're talking about. And I'm yeah, trying to, so I'm, he, he trying to wrap my brain here. I'm, I'm an idiot, so you. <laughs> yeah, so so am I. It's okay. <laughs> so Stop. he had he, Stop. he 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 just had um uh an article that I just read, and there the U the UFC was interested in signing him. And he said. I don't really know if I want to do that. I mean, I had seven fights in the last two years. Is like, I don't think I'm going to be able to stay that active if I'm with the UFC because they don't have that many heavyweight fights. He's like, I'd rather just stay kind of open and free and be able to sign one-off fights or two-off fights and know that I'm going to be active um, uh, as opposed to being locked down with one promotion and then you have a hard time deciding your own career. You know, like... Okay, well, let's compare this to um, uh, 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 a framing contractors. A framing contractor can, like, go and build a house, like, do a job, do a contract, and then 
they can go like work on another contract as soon as they're done. Um, that's from a different company, like no problem, and they can stay as busy and build a company as they please. The independent contractors, spiders are like that. We're a brand, so right. I realistically would love to go and build my brand wherever it's best for me to to do that. And the way MMA is set up right now, we can't do that. But something I'd like to try to set up in my in my contract. All right. All right. Well, let me ask you just one more question. When when did you realize you could do a split? What's that? When did you realize you could do a split? Like, you mean, like, walk away from the UFC, or you mean that I full no, split? A full split. A full split. <laughs> okay, I, I so... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, look, I can, I've tried to do it. Listen, I'm, I was a catcher in baseball for years and years, yeah. and I've tried to do something of that, but I've hurt myself. i pulled groin muscles. How the hell do yeah. you realize you can do that? Okay, so this is probably not how it usually happens, but when I was like... <laughs> I I don't know. I think I was like ten or nine or ten or something. I forget how old I was. But uh, you ever see those guys and like you know like they're playing guitar and they go in the splits, but it's not really the splits. One leg forward and the other one's kind of off to the side. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. You seem to. So I, I tried to do that and I thought that's what I was going to do. But I went down the real split, but my my leg went behind me and I tore my hamstring. I was like ten, eleven years old or something. No, yeah, it was horrible. It was like a very bad, pretty bad injury. I couldn't get off the couch for three weeks. My my sister took care of me. I had to like, I couldn't get up to the bathroom, so I had to pee a cup. It was pretty. So anyway, <laughs> after that, after that, it healed like it it, it 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 tore and it healed and stretched and uh, it it healed long. So now anytime I want, I could literally be walking down the street. I can do the splits just because the muscle belly healed, stretched out, if that makes sense. Hey, you're no I joke, man. Whatever I mean, every time, every, you know, I'm always expecting you just to drop down into a split. Like if you and I were talking face-to-face, just getting coffee, I'd expect you to order your coffee in a full split. So. <laughs> it's like Van Damme. Or start breakdancing out of nowhere, man. When you start breakdancing. <laughs> all right, so, all right. So this is, all right, this is a good story, too. So my buddy and I, I remember once, uh, uh, you guys Canadian? You guys Canadian or? I I am not, I'm American. I, I listen. I lived in Buffalo, New York, and I have many of friends who are Canadian, and okay, I love Canada. So, so. there's this uh, this show, this this the music station out there was called Much Music, um, and I remember watching this this rap city one day. Uh, that was that was like the hip hop show, and I was really into like kind of started getting into the sweet dog, and I was into rap when I was younger, and uh, and these break dancers came on. I hate it. Uh, well, I stayed up till 3.30 in the morning because it re-ran in the middle of the night. So I stayed up and I taped it and I showed it to my friend. I'm like, hey, man, look at these guys. Look at these break dancers. He's like, wow, that's cool. So we we studied that tape and we got cardboard and we put it on my back deck. Um, and there's some houses behind us and these girls would watch us like, because we tried for months to like do what they were doing. And we just fell on our faces and like looking like And I remember these girls that lived behind us. Um, they used to go out the window like, what are you doing, you losers? Nice drink dancing, you idiots. You know, I'm like, oh, screw you, you know, you just that, you know. And uh, <laughs> so we do it for months and months. And eventually we got so good at it, we would go to, like, the school dances and, like, people would gather around and watch us. And we'd have battles and competitions. And, and then after a while, we started, like, I started studying Michael Jackson. I started studying, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the the – the movie Beach Street and Breaking One and Two and stuff. We we got those. Oh uh, yeah. Start. Yeah yeah yeah. So we started scouring the internet. Eh, what the hell? Yeah, we find like different break dancers and we 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 practice. And, um, actually, the guy from Breaking One Two, Michael Boogaloo, Boogaloo Shrimp, he's actually uh, a good friend of mine. Uh, and uh, we're probably gonna do a video, a break dancing video here in the next couple months. So yeah. So <laughs> that, that's how that's kind of how it, how it all started. That's awesome. Every time I try to dance, man, I look like a total buffoon. And well, uh, it, 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 if my robot dance was any kind of a mating dance, I would never ever have children because the chicks do not like it. <laughs> you know, hey, right? Out. People are in awe, of it, but they're all like, "Wow, that's sexy." Hey, Ryan, this is HR. I just wanted to ask you what was your thoughts on uh, the retirement of Jordan Maine and Frankie Perez. You know, yeah, Perez so, just got um, us. Go ahead. Prices, I'm what? sorry. 
well, Fred just you know got a big win in uh, in UFC just last week, and then he announces his retirement. And I mean, he's still fairly young. And uh, Jordan Main, I mean, he he's a beast. The twenty five. Yeah, they're yeah. both twenty five years old, I believe. Yeah, so um, I I guess it's, it's it's an individual thing. Some guys um, they get into the game, and they you know maybe their the dream was to fight on that stage, and then they get in there, and it wasn't what they wanted. Um, maybe they set a particular goal for themselves, and then once they accomplish it, like, yeah, no. and then sometimes maybe it's a little darker path. You know, they have an injury or maybe they're starting to get some head trauma, and they're like, yeah, I don't really think I want to keep going on with this. You know, and then sometimes maybe it could be uh, something like they look at the landscape of what the business side is like. Like, I'm not going to support my family in this. I, I better put my eggs in another basket. So it could be a number of things, uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's really an individual thing about what, what what those guys will be doing. But I, I think if those guys can get out of it when they're young and uh, and they're happy and healthy, and, and that, that's probably the smartest way to do it. I look at George St. Pierre and the way he retired. He t- retired as a champ. He retired on top with all his money, um, with his image still good intact. And, um, you know, you could tell that he was starting to have some head trauma issues, you know, and this is not a... You know, we're not in an office every day just typing on a keyboard. This is a pretty dangerous sport, you know. Like, there's some serious problems later on. Uh, and, you know, if we look at other contact sports, the NFL, um, you know, other other things like that, you can see that this has an effect on guys as they age, you know. And um, so the way George St. Pierre did I thought, was the best way to do it. As he started seeing these problems come on, he decided, like, I'm stepping away from the sport. I, I've, I've made my money, I, I've, I've made my name, and I'm going to do um, maybe more important, more productive things with my, my time. Uh, well, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. that's pretty profound to me because I didn't even think of it in that that aspect. It, I, I, I read the Internet, I, I listen to people talk, and everybody has something to say about George St. Pierre retiring in, in, in this, in this for, for, for this reason, I guess. But you make a, a very valid point, um, head injury and things like that. You know, you reference the NFL, you reference um, boxing, things like that. Do, do you get nervous? Do you get scared? Do you feel like you need to pr- protect yourself as far as head injury and things like that? Um, well, uh, well, with my style, you know, I'm a karate, karate stylist, so I don't get in there and trade a lot of punches. You know, I'm, I'm a I'm a stand aside, pick them apart. I take I take the occasional hit, but for the most part, um, I I don't take a lot of a lot of damage to my to my cranium. So, but it is something that that crosses my mind. You know, like this is pretty dangerous, and uh, you know, I, I try to be as smart as I can in regards to training, in regards to um, the fights. But uh, you know, th- this is something that is on my mind, and so. Uh, I'm a, I, I compete in chess. I'm a competitive chess player as well. I, yeah. Uh, so I set yeah, my I've seen that. I heard you're a very good chess player. Yeah. So I set my computer on a certain level, and, you know, there's always highs and lows. Like, you know, go through, like, you know, a week or something where you're not playing very well, and then you come back and you play good. It's just kind of like training as well. But, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of, like, keep very close track of my mental acuity, acuity. I keep very close track of my, my balance. I keep very close track of, um, you know, my memory and stuff. So that's, that's just very important. And, and one thing that guys don't realize, that's, that's another really unspoken kind of thing that happens in our sport is um, I was just at the uh, ABC uh, meeting in, uh, what was it, San Jose or was it Nevada? San Diego. I think it was San Diego. Um and uh, there was one, one guy that, that put on a presentation there, and it was about uh, uh, safety and, and head trauma and, and what they do for, the, for fighters, for boxers, for football players. And uh, sometimes they test them after, the, after the, the fight. And so they test, like, blood flow. They test balance. They test all these other things, uh, reflexes. Um, and they, they test how the, how the person, the athlete, feels. Um, and... Believe it or not, people right after a fight when they just had a whole bunch of head trauma, they said, how do you feel? They said, I feel great. And then they test it and they're way <laughs> off. You know what I mean? So uh, this is something that, thankfully, science is starting to catch up to this, that we can 
start making putting steps in place that uh, that will help fighters with that and will help. I mean, I'm, I'm referring to fighters because that's what we do, but help all contact athletes with that so that it will lower the, the rate of head trauma um, uh, crippling later on in life. Hey, Ryan, I, I just, I, I personally uh, like to thank you. I'm a big MFC uh, fan. And uh, the years you was in MFC, I mean, you just went through the division. Like, I mean, you go you was a champion, uh, title defense twice. And, and then uh, the time you was in the UFC, you've had, uh, you know, you was in the categories for best knockouts of the year, knockout of the night, performance of the nights, and, and, uh, I, I just personally want to thank you for the entertainment, man, and I, I can't hardly wait to see you back again, wherever that may be. <laughs> It'd be nice if you get on a November the 6th card at Bellator and I'd come see you, but, uh, yeah, man, thanks for the for the good entertainment, man. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, thanks for the kind word, man. I'll uh, make sure I uh, knock some heads next time I'm in the ring for you. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, do the same for me too, man. I love watching you. Yeah, and I got, I got one, I got one last question for you. Yeah. Do you do you think Danielson on the Karate Kid was the real bully? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I don't know. Uh, you guys saw that video, right? right? Yeah. So, uh, yeah. I just start analyzing a little bit. Like, wait a second. Wait a second. Hey, it's got me thinking too. That little bastard. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Well done, man. Well done. Is Mr. Maggie yeah, some sort of alcoholic sociopath? Or what's going on here? He's <laughs> <laughs> a little punk, man. man. Come to think of it, a little New York <laughs> punk, just a uh, troublemaker. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Fine, oh man. We're, we're all pulling for you here in, in, uh, in the Madhouse, man. We, we, we actually appreciate everything you've done for us. Um, You've come on numerous times. You've talked to all of us. Uh, we appreciate it, and we are going to follow. Um, you got to. You got your hands full, man. You, you got to fight outside of the fights, man. You, you know, you're going to train and you're going to do your thing, but you, you're doing bigger and better things for the the kids and and whatnot coming up behind you. So, um, do me a favor, pat yourself on the back tonight before you go to bed because you're doing a a big, um, a, a big service for all of these young youngsters and we appreciate it. Ryan, I, Thanks, I really appreciate, I appreciate that. Um, anytime you, you want to come on, anytime you want to you know, rap, anytime you want to do splits, and, <laughs> anytime you want to kick me in the face, you're good. You can come on <laughs> <up with me. laughs> awesome, guys. <laughs> and, uh, where, where, where can we find you on um, social media, Twitter, Facebook, pin, Pinterest? You got it, Pinterest? Or, uh, uh, no, that's a tough story confusing me. I'm a bit of a caveman when it comes to that. I can barely handle my Facebook and my Twitter account. I get an email. That's like I'm like kind of overwhelmed with those guys. So Twitter at Ryan Jimmo, and uh, I have a Facebook Ryan Jimmo. So uh, All right. I'm very imaginative. So yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Listen, hey, um, right. when when things kind of when things kind of blow over and kind of settle down, let's let's talk and let's kind of catch up on where um, we're at today as a, or tomorrow as opposed to today. How's that? Yeah, that sounds great, guys. Hey, right, thanks, you want right. to give a, give a shout out to your sponsors or anything? You want to go right in? It's yeah, your time. Um, I, I want to thank uh, most of all, like uh, Power MMA for uh, for uh, just being a great gym and 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 uh, you know being there for me and being a great gym for to give me an environment to uh, craft myself. And uh, I want to show for the MMA FA, the Mixed Martial Arts Fighters Association that we're uh, we're forming up. And uh, soon enough, we're going to be real, real adults, and uh, you know, we're going to be a real sport. We had um, Rob on a couple weeks ago, and then we're having yeah. you on. And to be 100% honest with you, in this, I haven't even talked to my producer about this, but or my co-host, but my my degree is in sports management, and I want to. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm working towards my um, law degree and, and whatnot, and and this is something that's very. <laughs> it's close to home, basically, and I can't stand Dana White. So, listen, I'll jump on board any day of the week. But um, I think for the next couple of weeks, we're going to be your your sounding board because I want to be a part of it, <laughs> and I want to help okay. get the word out. So, 
I, I really am. I'm, I'm really excited about what you guys are doing and in, in the steps you're taking because there's there's kids. My, my son's nine. I don't know if tomorrow he wants to say, Dad, hey, listen, I want to be an MMA fighter and I want to I want to fight in the UFC, but you don't want to fight in the UFC of today. You know, you want to fight in the UFC of a couple of years because there's guys like Ryan Jimmo and and, and Vanderlei Silva and, and, and Kung Lee and, and people that are taking a stand to to make it what it should be, man. And I appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for the kind words. And, uh, you know, we're fighting a pretty tough fight every day. And I, there's a, there, I, I'm not going to get this quote right, but um, they said, good men plant seeds for trees that they'll never sit under. And that's what we're doing right now. We're, we're kind of planting seeds. And it's not going to affect us because we're kind of all the guys right now where, I mean, I'm going to have to, again, only go to three or four years. And I might see a little bit of a sprout but it's going to be the next generation coming up, the 20-year-olds who want to, you know, make this a career that it's really going to affect them, and they're going to be you know in a good that, environment. Man. Amen, Amen, brother. <laughs> well, you guys, you guys are going to be noticed as the legends that's changed uh, the sport around. That's for damn sure. Like Don Fryer, the Ken Shamrocks, how they brought up uh, mixed martial arts. You guys are going to be right there with them because, you know, you made the sport better again. Absolutely. And, and that's the thing. That's I talked to. I was talking, trying to talk to Rob about a couple of weeks ago when, when we just got cut off. And, I mean, the question I asked him when we got cut off was, did you ever feel like this was the place you were going to go? Like, when you guys decided to, 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 to have this lawsuit, to bring this lawsuit, to, you know, to the forefront, was this where you wanted to go? And he was like, well, and I was like, no, man, you didn't. Because I don't no. care what answer you got because it wasn't, in your in your mind that it was going to be this big. So big ups to Rob, you, man. Really Rob, true. Big ups to you, man. Rob's been working on this for like 11 years. The amount of sweat and equity and thought that Rob has put into this is absolutely unreal. Like, he's going to, oh, okay. you know, it, it, it's unreal. That guy has, like, sacrificed quite a bit for this. And, uh, no. yeah, he, he he's really, the, he's really our, our linchpin, you know? Fair enough, but you know what? He also still has to have good people behind him. So you're one of those good people, man. And you need to pat yourself on the back and say, you know what? I'm doing what's right because I got two little boys. I got an eight and a three year old. My three year old's just kicking ass all over the house, so I'm not worried about him. He'll, he'll sign with Bellator if he has to. But my other <laughs> son's kind of a, kind of a, you know, he'll, he'll just go wherever the money is. So, but, you know, I mean, you're, you're fighting the battle for, 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 Kids are going to sit under the tree that you've planted seeds for, man. So I appreciate that, Ryan, and and that's that's as real as I can get. So I I thank you for Thanks, that. Man. And, yeah, man, and uh, you are always welcome on the show, and and I appreciate everything you've done. So one more time, tell everybody where they can find you. Tell everybody your sponsors. You know, I I know it's you know Ryan Jimmo. <laughs> Let's give it give yeah. it. <laughs> that's all I got. At Ryan Jimmo on Twitter and Ryan Jimmo on Facebook. <laughs> Fair I enough. Been more imaginative. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I appreciate the kind words. Hey, great talking to you, Ron. Have a great night. Yeah, it's Thanks, been a pleasure, man. Care yourself. Best of luck to you. Let's, let's talk after things kind of settle down a little bit, huh? Sure. Thank you, guys. All right, man. Ladies and gentlemen, Ryan Jimmo, um, one of the one of the catalysts, one of the one of the um, founding fathers, do I say? I don't even know, guys. I mean, how do I... How and do one I of the most here, intelligent sure. fighters to ever speak. I mean, I've never heard a fighter that, that speaks so oh, well and he's so intelligent. And funny at the same time. He had me cracking up I don't know how many times. Great impersonations of, like, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Yeah, I mean, he's so, <laughs> like, <Joe> um, <laughs> so well thought out. He's so well, you know, um, um, well spoken. I mean, but... But the cool thing is, is that he gets it, man. He gets that he is planting a seed for for what did he say? I'm, I'm planting a seed for the tree that I'll never sit under, right? So exactly, that's, that's cool stuff, man. He he gets it. He he he's not man, man, oh man. I I I, I would love to dig up some prior Ryan Jimmo uh, um, interviews that I've had because he's just a he's just very. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he he's very um, uh, man. What, I don't even know what the hell the word is I'm looking for. But he's very focused. I guess he's focused. He's, he's focused in what he wants to do. He's focused in how he wants to get there. He's focused. 
so I think focus is the word, but man, I, I he's driven. Talk. Yeah. yeah, he's very yeah, driven, he's driven to do what Absolutely. he does. Absolutely. Well, he, he's not. Um, he's very calculated. He's very well spoken, and he's he's fun to talk to, man. He, you know, we talked to him for over an hour and a half. You know, he's uh, an easy conversation, right? Yeah, we could have kept going another hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, man, he's very, very funny. I like the way he's talking. I felt like I know him. I've never met the guy in my life, <laughs> except, you know, watching him on YouTube and UFC. Right, and when you see him on TV, it's like, man, he just is so, like, intense, and he's got the, the bald head, and, he, you know, he's doing the, the splits, and, the, you know, he's focused. He's knocking people and out and stuff, does. you know, and he's just such a nice guy. Yeah, man. So, Brian Jim was always a friend on the show, and, <clears throat> and you know, I... I haven't talked to Carl about this, but like I really want to kind of keep continually following up on this, on this Ali uh, Ali Act and um, the the lawsuit because I think it's important. I think we are in a spot uh, that can um, that can be. Well, I, the thing about I it, think it's we're, to happen. we're in a I mean... spot where. People, I hear people talking to me. Or is that you guys, or is that somebody else? That was H- HR talking. I totally agree with HR. It has to, it has to happen. We have to be talking about this, and fighters need to be talking about this because yeah. it's it's like what you were saying earlier. It's like a slave auction. You know what I mean? It's like what they're doing is they're owning people, and you know they're not really treating anybody fairly, except like the the couple okay. that they pick okay. out, like is like and Ronda Rousey get- or Conor McGregor, and it's not fair for all the other fighters. You know what, I, I I sent Carl a message the other day, on uh, just a private message, that was like, hey, listen, I'm going to do something on the show on Monday night. And he's like, what's that? And I said, here's Ronda Rousey's phone number. Let's call her on the air. I want to call her. I don't want to call her out. I want to I want to talk to her. I've talked to her in the past, but I want to talk to her again. I want to, I want to, I want to dig, man. I got I got some friends in the business. I got, let's do this, man. Let's, let's be the ones that people come to and listen to. You know what I mean? Everybody's got a podcast, but let's start. Let's start digging. Let's start being the ones. You know what I mean? Yes. So, anyway, man, we got. Uh, holy shit! It's almost uh, eleven o'clock. Man, we 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 go an hour and a half. <laughs> well, yeah, so, I, what, I what, what, enjoyed what, it. I had a great time. Um, I want to. I want to do it on something real quick, quick Jason. Uh, if you don't care, uh, what are y'all's thoughts on? Now, before, you know, the contour Emilieko bout, it didn't occur because of Zufa's insistence upon obtaining promotional options. Zufa offered uh, Fedor was the most lucrative, uh, objected to the onerous requirements of Zufa promotional contract and refused to sign with Zufa. As a result, Fedor went from number one heavyweight on the planet to Fedor sucks. Yes. And that's via that yeah. one. So now... Now we're here getting this rumors, or I don't know, if it, I don't even know if it's a rumor now or not. But I've heard that Fedor has signed for the UFC. So, what yes. do you think has made the difference between then and now? Money, money, money. I think that so Dan I mean, White offered him a. He's got to be a disgusting a ton amount of, money. Load of Yeah, but is it going to be different than the way that the other fighters are? Oh yeah, and this behind, is why. Just just like Ryan was talking about tonight, just behind the scenes. Uh, what do you call them? Um, locker room deals. Right? Locker room payments, so, yeah. So locker room bonuses, uh, yeah, that's crazy. So, Fedor, from what I've heard, I, I have two people that have confirmed uh, to me, but I don't know 100. percent I didn't put it out there, but Fedor has signed with the UFC, and it's going to be announced shortly, but. What I understand is that he um, he was given a flat contract by Bellator. He turned it down because it was it couldn't come near what the UFC has offered him. So, mm. so it, I just wonder: is the offer uh, through Reebok, or is it just under the, the uh, locker room bonus? That I don't know. I don't know. I just know the money is not anywhere near what Bellator offered him. So It'll be interesting to find out, huh? Yeah, I can't wait to find out. <laughs> so we'll see. I mean, it's going to come out that he's going to 
sign, and it's he's gonna have. Well, if you if you watch um, the last Ronda Rousey fight, she had a monster logo on her right, almost near her right breast. So it's small, but you know it, she has separate logos on the 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 Reebok gear. So it is what it is. And that, but and this was the same way that uh, happened with Matt Leland. Uh, which at one point was a logical contender for uh, Fedor, but for a title match. But it turned out, Lyndon was dropped from the division for the, I guess, the same reasons. And that's why we need the Ali Act to pass. I want to ask you I'm all not... something. Uh, how do you feel about the special treatments with the fighters? Like, you know, how they treat Ronda or Conor McGregor and, you know, how they treat, other great fighters, you know, like Ryan Gemma, like how he's just cast out from the side. You know what I mean? How do you think, feel about that? I think that's uh, what I watch a lot of do with the. Uh, go ahead, Jason. I'm sorry. No, I was just gonna say no, no. You're good. You're good. I, I was just. Um, I, I laugh because I, I watch a lot of the, the fighter payments when they come out, and um, you know, I, you get people like. I don't know who was just in the last um, uh, Robbie Lawler a couple fights ago. I mean, he only, you know, he's a champion. He only made fifty fifty k or hundred k. Really, hundred thousand dollars? I mean, after the most brutal fight of all time, his face looked right. like a meat grinder. And same thing with uh, Roy McDonald. I mean, how can they pay for all those medical bills and still right. live a? You know, I know he's a champion and. Roy McDonald, you know, is a number one contender and all, but, you know, they got paid chump change for the beating that they took. Why didn't they get, you know, way more money? It, it makes no sense. And Conor McGregor walks out with, you know, millions of dollars, and he's not even the real champion. Right. It, it right. just baffles me. You're right. I, 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 I got nothing for it. I think that's part of the Sherman Antitrust Act because uh, – you know, the, the suit uh, that they got accuses the company of illegally maintaining monopoly and monopoly power by systematically eliminating competition from rival earnings from bouts and merchandising, marketing activities through restrictive uh, contracting and other exclusionary uh, practices. So, I mean, that that should stop. If, if, yeah, it's you disgusting. Know, you know, that that should put an end to that uh, favoritism. What you, what your, your question was, and, you know, then uh, I mean, it, it, it's going to stop a lot of the, you know, the activities that's going on. That's that's unfair. Just plain and simple. Exactly. All right, fellas. Listen, let's do it next week, man. We got um, seven days to 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 rack our brains for. Um, any type of MMA, any type of combat sports, any type of anything you want to wrap, man. I mean, let's, you know, the, the the U.S. Open is going on right now, so you know, let's talk. <laughs> hey, <laughs> anybody out there follow me on uh, much Facebook, much. HR Jimmy Baker? Uh, much, uh, 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 um, uh, um, a uh, U.S. Open fan? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, no. <laughs> Basketball, man. But uh, <laughs> Jimmy underscore Baker 34 on Twitter and Shake and Bake 3476 on Instagram. Shit, yeah, find me Waylon Thacker on YouTube. <laughs> Again, Waylon Thacker on YouTube. I do a lot of yeah, rants. Yeah, HR Baker on YouTube, too. <laughs> Subscribe. Listen to HR Baker, YouTube. Wait, listen, we're going to we're gonna chit-chat a little bit about your um, – you've got a band, man. I didn't know you had a band. Let's, oh, let's I play music all the time, man. You know. Let's pump that band a little bit, man. We'll talk about it next week. How's that sound? That sounds awesome. What's the name of your band, Wayden? Uh, we ain't got a name yet, man. It's just me, my drummer, and bassist, you know, and we just play let's a lot of Metallica play, and man. Slayer. Let's play <laughs> next week. A couple, couple of minutes before we go to uh, for our next interview. Let's get them on the air. That'd be awesome. Sounds good. All right, man. Ladies and gentlemen, we are... Um, inside the asylum, right? We're that's that's our name, right? Well, that's our band name. We're inside the exactly. asylum. Inside the asylum. <laughs> inside the asylum, um, dudes. Father Man, Man, Waylon Sacker, and H.R. Baker. I am 
Jason London for Inside the Asylum, Monday night, 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. Listen, we're going to blow the roof off. I, I, I feel like I'm... Um, um, what's the name of that movie? The the, the firm. I feel like we're, we're, this is the firm. We're blowing the roof off um, the UFC. So. Um, and uh, I think uh, Carl's working on a, a guest next week that is uh, will uh, blow the roof off too, just like tonight. So I got a couple, now. man. I, I I got some of my back pocket stuff. We'll we'll get at it, man. We're, we're gonna we're gonna continue to to bang the drum. So uh, next Monday night, nine thirty Eastern Standard Time, right here. Uh, inside the Asylum for Coral, Whalen, and HR, I'm Jason London, Inside the Asylum. Have a good evening, guys.